Oh, that's good. Uh, yeah. So as introduced, I'm a hacker at TypeSafe, which means I work on the ACA toolkit. And I've been also part of the Reactive Streams, uh, let's call it movement or committee, which has been uh, developing a specification and a test kit for interop of different uh, stream implementations. Other than that, yeah, a bunch of other open source stuff, such as the JMH uh, performance benchmarking plugin for uh, SBD. Yeah, other than that, a bunch of uh, community things and conferences I run. Uh, you may have heard of seeing them, but this is not very important today. Today, let's focus on code. So the plan for today is first to actually introduce what reactive streams are. Uh, perhaps not everyone is yet familiar with them. Uh, so we'll talk about the concepts and what the specification actually means and why we need it. And then a little bit how it actually works. So how it really works behind the scenes. To then jump into Akka Streams, which is one of the implementations of this specification, but it actually provides a useful API. You can really work with and do stuff because the Reactive Streams APIs are very, very, very low level and you wouldn't get much done if you were just restrained to these APIs. Uh, so there's going to be a bunch of concepts of Akka Streams, a few examples, and then I have a bunch of code prepared in my IDE. Uh, so we can jump and do some hacking. At the end, um, yeah, I said before, all questions and answers, type them into the questions pane, and then we'll go over a few. Uh, if there's some questions are outstanding, I'm happy to follow up over email. So we'll see how that goes. So what is a stream? So in general, uh, there's this nice definition that you cannot enter the same river twice. That's Heraclitus, so ancient Greece, but it actually fits very well. So the general idea is um, that if you work with streams, if you look at the same stream twice, you may get different data, right? Because it's this flowing stream of data and you're just observing a part of it. This, of course, depends uh, on the type of stream because there may be streams which are backed by a collection Right? And if you observe a stream from a collection, you may always get the same elements, right? Because the stream always, always materializes from the first and goes to the last element of a collection. But you cannot always do that, right? If you read from a socket, for example, or I don't know, watch a live uh, video stream and you don't buffer stuff, you may not be able to go to the beginning of time to see stuff. It's a live stream most of the time. So let's talk about reactive streams. Uh, reactive is a big word, of course, recently, all over the media and internet. But what do we actually mean when we say reactive streams? Because it's a very precise definition, at least in the specification terms. So of course, we're talking about stream processing. So some number of elements will be going over a bunch of transformation steps. And then you get the uh, end result. But now the key features come in. So it has to be back pressured. By back pressure, we mean, um, for example, if you are processing um, or generating some, some a huge number of data, and someone has to count a very complex algorithm on top of that data, perhaps that consumer of your data, which is easy to produce, is not able to keep up with processing this complex algorithm. So this is where back pressure comes in where the subscriber, the, the receiver of this data, is able to signal to the publisher, so the generator of this data, that it can't keep up. And we can do different stuff about that. And it has to be asynchronous. Well, um, it doesn't really have to, because the specification is broad enough to allow synchronous execution, but it is really aimed for asynchronous and possibly even distributed, because it's uh, possible to implement this over the network. Um, yeah, processing. So this means, for example, in Akka, we have this famous mantra that never block. And this, of course, plays very well with reactive streams because you never really have to block on, I don't know, some call because someone is taking a long time to process an element. Instead, you may be forced to be back pressured and stop producing things, but that's not the same as being blocked by some blocking I.O. call. 
And then the, the key feature of this thing is that it's standardized. So by standardized, we mean there's a number of implementations and everybody abides the same protocol. So here's the summary, backdress at the synchronous stream processing in a standard. Um, if you want to read up on the standard and the technology compatibility kit, which I implemented, there's the reactive streams web page and there's um, yeah, all the background behind it. So go ahead, check it out. Okay, but who is actually running this? Uh, of course, there's us, TypeSafe, but there's also other companies behind it and backing it, such as Netflix with their Rx libraries. I'm sure you've heard of those. And other companies, such as Pivotal and Red Hat, uh, with their implementations of the same specification. And now to the, to the key, what this uh, specification gives us. So for example, if you have this pipeline, where different elements are reactive streams, Rx, Akka, or Reactor, thanks to everybody abiding to the same protocol, you're able to connect these without any kind of, uh, well, hard work, let's put it this way. Because they all abide to the same protocol, they are able to back pressure from end to end. So in, in this graph example, Reactor is able to back pressure the Akka system, the Akka system can back pressure React. Rx, and Rx can back pressure some reactive streams publisher. So this is really huge. And one thing to note is uh, that the API I'm going to describe right now may not be the easiest to implement. And in fact, it's not really aimed at everybody implementing their own reactive streams thing. It's more aimed at if a database driver or, I don't know, a video processing library is able to expose such interface, um, most users will just use those. So it's for this interop, but most of the time you won't be implementing those directly. You may be using Akka to consume this, or you may be using Reactor to consume this. Uh, here I get, I've got an example how this all fits together. So each line uh, you can see here is actually a different Reactive Streams implementation all embedded in a uh, red pack web, web server. So you can see we start with an Rx observable, then we go over reactive streams into a Akka source, which then maps these bunch of numbers to a string. And then we go over to Reactor, which does a different thing. And they all connect together and work together to produce, to produce the result. So in essence, we're trying to fight back uh, lock-in because I mean, if you can't connect one API to another API, it is some form of lock-in. With the Reactive Streams APIs, we are able to open up and use everybody's best features. So that's the broad overview about what it actually is. But what is this back pressure thing? Um, like I said, we have a situation where we have a publisher and a subscriber, and they talk to each other, of course. That's what we do. And one thing to notice is they are strictly typed, as in this publisher will be producing things of type T. Well, it can produce subtypes of T, but you get the idea, which is different to Akka actors, which currently are untyped. But we are changing that also. So the problem appears when you have a fast publisher and a slow subscriber, right? So both have some rate of processing. And in this case, when you have a fast publisher, it would overwhelm the, the subscriber. So why do I need back pressure? Let's look at the uh, typical example. So the publisher tries to send some data. Of course, one way or another, there's going to be some buffer space on the receiving end, even if it's uh, just a list of elements, just a, some kind of buffer, or even the TCP buffer on a different system. There is some kind of buffer always. Um, and we fill out that buffer. So what can happen next? The subscriber is not really able to process at the same rate as it's being given data. So what's going to happen is we're going to overflow the buffer. So what do we do? How do we handle buffer overflows? Well, most of the time, um, you will drop the messages because you do not have any space to fit the messages. And then the publisher will have to resend or just live with the fact that you lost data. But let's say we resend data. It may seem a bit costly that you just drop the data and then you resend it. But please keep in mind that, I mean, 
every TCP-based system does exactly this. If a TCP buffer is full, messages, or packets in that case, will be dropped on the floor and will have to be resent. So it's a valid strategy, but we can do better than that. So a typical answer is, um, yeah, I can send a NAC. So sending a NAC is when you notice that, oh my god, I'm going to overflow my buffer space. So you notice this, and you want to avoid an out-of-memory error, for example, you can send a NAC. So NAC stands for negative acknowledgement, and it works like this. And then we're going to talk about if it's enough or not. So the subscriber notices that it has not much space left in its buffer, and perhaps it is in danger of overflowing the buffer. Then it can send this orange arrow on the bottom here. It can send to the publisher asynchronously a negative acknowledgement, uh, which would mean that, hey, dear publisher, would you mind stop sending data for a while? And yeah, the, the away behaved publisher will just stop sending data then. The, the only problem with that is that it may not get there in time. So I notice my buffer space is running out. I send out the negative acknowledgement. But in the meantime, because this is a asynchronous system, there were some messages in flight which ended up overflowing the buffer anyway. So this is bad. This obviously isn't safe. But what happens if we have a slow publisher and a fast subscriber? Let's talk about the inverse uh, way of um, doing back pressure. So the previous one is negative acknowledgement. So if we can't keep up, we say, yeah, I can't keep up. The other way is pulling. So every time I'm ready to consume an element, I tell the subscriber, give me an element. But that doesn't really scale in a situation where we have a fast subscriber and a slow publisher. Because there will be a lot of spamming going on back in the opposite direction. So the subscriber will keep telling the publisher that it's ready to consume data at a rate a hundred, a thousand times more sometimes than the data is able to be produced, emitted. So that's no good. So the reactive streams back pressure model is a combination of those two models. So we sometimes call it dynamic push-pull. But effectively, we have two observations here. If we just use the push model, so the NAC model, uh, it is not safe, right? And we want our model to be safe. If we just use pull, it's going to be too slow in the opposite situation when the subscriber is actually fast. So the solution is to switch between these modes. But the switching can't really be um, explicit as in, ooh, now I'm in push mode, ooh, now I'm in pull mode. It has to be built into the protocol. So here's the reactive stream solution to back pressure. What it does is when you have a slow subscriber, well, and you have any kind of subscriber, it will tell to the publisher, uh, give me some data. And the sum is a concrete number uh, that we give in the request message. So I can say request free, which means I am ready to consume free messages. Uh, this may seem very similar to the pull model, and it in a way is, because we are only pulling data and the publisher is not allowed to signal more data than we have asked him to send us. But here we are able to batch together these requests. So instead of pulling three times, I can just say request, three elements, and wait for the publisher to, to do this. And also, because I know my buffer space, I am able to just look at my buffer space and estimate how many elements I'm able to consume safely. So um, here I said, yeah, my buffer is uh, able to, to still keep free elements. So I told the publisher request free and he'll eventually signal me free elements. They all have this pre-allocated space in the buffer, so I'm not going to blow up my memory. In, in the other situation, where we have a fast subscriber, the protocol doesn't change, right? It's the same. But I'm able to batch together these request signals and say request 6, or every time I uh, make my buffer empty, 
say, request 10, because that's my buffer size. So there is a small field for, well, intelligent algorithms which fine-tune the request strategy. Because I know how the system is behaving, I can adjust the number of elements I'm requesting at runtime, based on however the system is performing. And of course, because this is asynchronous, we can send these request signals whenever we want. Right? And we are still guaranteed to be safe. OK, uh, one other thing, of course, the publisher can accumulate this demand. So if I tell a publisher request free, he doesn't emit any data. And then I say again request free, and again, then he's going to have a total demand of nine. Maybe he is also waiting for the data from some other point, right? And then when he gets the data, he can start sending it and consuming his total accumulated demand. Because we never signal more than we can just uh, be signaled, we are still safe in this case on the subscriber end. Because we won't be signaling more requests than we are ready to consume. So once we have sent request my entire buffer size, we just wait until we get some signals up from upstream. So we're safe in this case. Um, there is a special case, and in some cases you perhaps really know that the subscriber will be faster, like way faster than the publisher. And the reactive stream specification we um, allow for requesting long max value. So this is a huge number and not really able to be saturated. And this makes uh, well allows the publisher to go at max speed. In some kinds of systems, it may be useful. So the spec doesn't forbid this. It's still fine. But you have, you really opt out of back pressure in this case, right? So you have to understand what you're doing once you request max value, because there's no way out after this one. Um, let's look at the pipelining in reactive streams. So imagine you have three stages, because each uh, stream is composed of different stages, and each does its own thing to a processing processed element. And let's say on the left, we have the source, the publisher of data, and on the right, we have the sync, the, the subscriber of some data. And in the middle, we have something that is both. In the reactive stream specification, we call this a processor. So it is both a publisher and a, and a subscriber. So let's imagine um, a typical use case. I'm about to start processing this stream of data, but I didn't yet uh, generate demand, because maybe that subscriber is starting up. It needs to allocate some stuff. But the publisher is maybe ready. Or maybe it can prefetch some data to be able to then more swiftly respond to the first request it gets. So this is an eager, a eager publisher. It start, starts up, loads up data, and then it waits for request. So it can, again, load up data into its buffer to be ready to signal as soon as it gets some demand. So it's drawing some stuff in its buffer. And then the downstream is finally ready to consume. We can then signal, yeah, request five to the processor in the middle. It, it then doesn't have to propagate the same demand. Um, it depends, right? It depends on how the processor is implemented. It depends on its logic. But yeah, it propagates the demand. And then we are able to signal the four or however elements we had preloaded. In this case, we signal four elements because this, this was the number of elements preloaded in the publisher. So we have a demand of two still available. We got six, signaled four, two still left. We, the publisher will now keep fetching new data into its buffer. And once it's, once it's ready, it will again signal it downstream. OK, and since all this happens asynchronously, we're going to end up with this picture of everybody having some amount of demand and asynchronously signaling downstream. But at the same time, every element in the processing pipeline will be able to reserve some buffer space and signal demand upstream all the time. 
So the general idea is that the buffer space is used in both ways. It is kind of reserved because we are signaling demand and we keep space for it. And we are expecting a bunch of elements to come in. So the green and blue are reserved spaces in the buffer for in incoming elements, elements which I'm expecting to be signaled soon. And this all goes all back to the, yeah, to the source of the data. Uh, the important thing, no one has to wait in this system, except if there is a slow element, which doesn't signal demand upstream. Then we are waiting for that guy to finally signal some demand. But if it is able to progress at a steady rate, we don't have to wait for anyone. OK, the SPI uh, looks like this. So we have a publisher. It is a subscribe method. The subscriber can subscribe to a publisher. So a publisher gives then to the subscriber a subscription. And yeah, there you have the subscriber. So the general idea is that the subscription is a, is a shared secret and a way of communicating between the publisher and the subscriber. So whenever I said, yeah, signal demand, here I mean that the subscriber, because it has the subscription, can call the request method, which signals demand to the publisher. So how does ACA fit all this? As I said, um, well, uh, as I said in the beginning, this is not a very fancy API. Of course, you can implement anything you want with it, but it's just a bit hard. I mean, normally you would like to have processing steps which are like filter or math or concat, that kind of operations. Here we don't really have that. We have the low level building blocks which enable the back pressure and asynchronous behavior. So ACA fits into the picture of providing these high level abstractions. So for those who haven't seen or heard about ACA before, ACA has a, a bunch of modules. We tend to think of it as a toolkit, more than a framework. Uh, and yeah, it's aimed for high performance concurrency and also clustering and distributed systems. So that's our goal. And one of the main modules is ACA Actor. And actor, um, uh, actors are an abstraction which provide you a very limited, in a way, set of features. So an actor can only send or receive messages, create other actors or change its behavior. So this is, in a way, limited. But in another way, um, you can model anything you want in it. And also, it's a great abstraction for concurrent systems. You are basically freed from many kinds of races. And inside an actor, you don't have to worry about concurrent access to mutable data structures, say. So that's the core of uh, what we have. This is how an actor looks. So you implement an actor by extending actor. You have a receive method. The next turn is a red message you would be given by someone. And then you can, you can reply to the sender of this message using the tell operator. So you would read this as sender tell decide move, where decide move is something that decides your next move in some game, for example. So this is the core. There's a bunch of other modules like clustering and persistence for CQRS event sourcing. But let's talk about ACA streams. That's what the talk is, is about. right? So um, the design goals are to be superiorly reusable, performant, and yeah, um, specifically, we really care about these bound buffer spaces. Maybe you heard me uh, oh, yeah, seconds ago ranting about buffer space. This is because we really care about this. OK, now the question is, why do we care about buffer space? So imagine you have this mm, yeah, normal web server. It may be even a chat server. And then imagine you know that you are able to process um, this request using a stream pipeline, because this is actually how we expose in ACA HTTP, an upcoming module, uh, how you process TCP connections and HTTP connections, right? So imagine you are able to model and exactly reason about the buffer space which will be used by every stream in your system. So in this case, 
I have yeah, one connection, and it's never using more date, more space than uh, than shown in the graph. Normally, maybe it would be more wanky. Maybe it would jump up and down and cause a lot of GC. In our case, we have these pre-allocated buffer spaces, and we just reuse them. So there's going to be a more stable memory-wise performance. And you can estimate how many connections am I able to consume on this server if it has yeah, 800 megs of RAM. OK, but now to the API. So the API uses um, slightly different wording than the reactive streams one. And this is also by, by choice, because we are modeling a bit higher, higher level abstractions, so we need better words for it. So a flow is something that has exactly one input and that's exactly one output. So think of it as map. Map is a great example, right? If you have a collection, you can map over it. And from a collection of ints, you can make it, a, make it into a collection of strings, for example. This would be a flow step. Then we have sources. So sources are where the data comes from, and they have exactly one not bound uh, the output port. And they sync, which has exactly one not bound port, which is its input. Um, yeah, transformation wise, you can just put a transformation into a map step, which, it, which in code looks like this. So we have a float double, and we map it to an end. Another uh, way of thinking about these is just thinking about, yeah, it's a pipe. And you, you can pipe things through this. And also, um, yeah, worth noting, I said it, does, it is not yet attached to a source, right? So when we say flow double, you're only saying this stream is ready to work on doubles. It doesn't yet have a source attached. OK, uh, some ACA basics for, for those who are not familiar with it. In ACA, we have something called an actor system. An actor system is something that contains all the actors in, in, in your application. Uh, it's basically a set of thread pools and configuration and a registry for locating and doing things with actors. Um, and then we need a flow materializer. So the flow materializer is the guy who is responsible of taking a flow description, a graph description of this processing pipeline, and turning it into a running uh, thing that is actually uh, doing stuff with this data. So it determines the how. The interesting thing is because we have a lifted representation of this flow processing graph, um, which means that anyone could write a flow materializer and materialize it into a different processing pipeline. But the description is really the same, right? You can uh, run a map computation on Spark. You can run a map computation on Akka. But you could also run it on Hadoop if you really want to, right? So this is an interesting feature. Not yet utilized, but we hope it will. So um, our flow materializer is currently actor-based, so the operations will be backed by actors, and they communicate asynchronously using messaging. And of course, you can configure it there. Um, now is the first time we see a sync in action. So here we have a sync for each, that for each int will do something with it. And then you pass a function that will get this each element, right? And then uh, the simplest way to the hello world of ACA streams is a source, one to three, which will produce these elements, one, two, and three. And then you run it to the sync, which will effectively just print it. I'll talk a little bit uh, further down the line about why it is so and that we have separate things for it. Some libraries have chosen to have just one abstraction. We have chosen to have uh, these different ones and think that it's easier to model and reason about these things if I know if it's a source or sync. And how does it actually materialize? It uses the implicit flow materializer uh, for non scalar people. Um, and a short explanation. So, implicit means when you see the implicit var mat flow materializer. It means that we can skip writing the parentheses mat uh, in the line where we have run with for each sync. This means less passing around parameters, and we always have some flow materializer in scope, 
so the compiler does this work for us. Uh, the Java APIs, because it's also fully usable from Java, uh, are actually very similar to this, especially with Java 8, where we now have lambdas. It looks very similar in most cases. Uh, yeah, except the materializer has to be, for example, passed explicitly and that kind of small cosmetic changes. So if you are a Java guy, you can use it from Java. So, yeah, the typical question is why the run with? So the run with is we run with some kind of thing, but for some kinds of operations, like for each and fold, we have um, pre built. Uh, well, sugars on source, so you can call it explicitly source for each print line. Uh, this is a terminal operation, mind you. The terminal operations, I mean something that actually materializes the flow. So it will start running at this point when you write the for each. Um, same with all the methods with have run in their names. We are currently in the process of renaming these, so for each will be called run for each and fold will be run, uh, called run fold. So whenever you see a method with run in the beginning, it will materialize the flow. So a bunch of um, type safety things we have in our streams. So I said that a flow is not yet attached to a source, but um, it, is, it is also not attached to a sink. So you cannot just attach it to a, swap, to a sink and expect it to run, it won't compile because it needs both. So, uh, yep, here. So in this example, I'm showing I have a flow that is um, yeah, not, not connected to anything yet. I cannot run with it. But if you take the flow and then connect it to a source, uh, oh, sorry, I, I have a mistake in this. Basically, what this says is you have to attach to both sides. You cannot materialize something in a vacuum. Oh, that's a, that's a better example. So when you have a flow, you can map these ends to a string, and then you can give it both ends of, of the processing pipeline. So the source, 1 to 10, and the sink, which is just a black hole sink. It will ignore the data that is coming to it. And interesting thing to say is the flows are reusable, which means that you can construct this pipeline once and then use it with multiple sources. This is also interesting because you can construct this complex processing pipeline just once, keep it cached in a, ver in a value, and then just use it multiple times to run for each request that is coming into your system, for example. Here we have a slightly more complex case. And also, here's a slight sneak peek of how you integrate with Akka Actors. So you just have an actor subscriber, which will then get all these elements, which are signaled by the upstream processing pipeline. And you have all the usual things, like map, filter, drop, group by. And group by is specifically interesting because it produces a stream of streams. Let's look at how this looks. So because I am getting some kind of numbers, 13, 12, 11, uh, when I group by the, the, the last um, cipher number, um, I'm going to get groups that are um, could be characterized as the thing that ends with a 1. And you get then out of this group by operator a stream that signals a pair of group key. So in my case, it would be 1, then 2, then 3. And for each of those, it gives you a substream of this. So then you can consume the substream or cancel it if you're not interested in, two, in things ending with the number two. You can just cancel the substream and just consume those you want to consume. This is very interesting because um, normally you would expect collections here, right? But in streams land, you really have to stop thinking about collections and just streams because a stream can be potentially infinite, right? And it cannot easily fit infinite elements into memory, at least not on current computers, right? So this is why everything is a stream, and you can apply stream operations to each of those substreams and group by again, or do different things. Okay, yeah, then you can consume the substreams and do different things with those. 
But uh, the thing I want to talk about today is draft processing. So this is a rather unique thing to Akka Streams. Uh, most of the other libraries are not so focused on complex graph processing as we are, I think. So in Akka Streams, this is called a flow graph. So whenever you see these F1, F2, F3, F4, imagine that is a flow. That is just a linear stream, right? Um, but what about these broadcast and merge things? These are what we call fan in, fan out operations, or also just junctions. So um, let's look at this example. The simplest, well, not simplest, but very simple graph. And try to model it. And then we'll look into how the ACA Streams DSL for graphs actually works. So also the design goal of this DSL is to, when you have your design session, you, you draw some stuff on the whiteboard and basically it will end up more or less like this, right? It's gonna be circles, it's gonna be arrows. So the design goal here is to make the circles graph elements and make the lines normal flow elements. So let me help you out with some coloring. In this case, every F, so every linear processing is mapped to a flow and they do different stuff with types. For example, F1 will take the input and map it to an intermediate value. Then F2 and F4 will make these intermediate values into some enriched values. And then we can just filter them in F3. Um, yeah, and these are the linear operations that we're going to use. Now let's look at the graph operations. So we start this by making a flow graph, and then we import the flow graph implicit to make this squiggly arrow operator available. And then we simply connect these. So when you notice the bcast, which is broadcast, and merge things, we just first define them. So we have a var bcast, which is a broadcast of intermediate values. Broadcast means every subscriber will get the same value when it came into this broadcast. And then we have a merge, which will just take from one or, or the other incoming stream and produce this outcoming merged stream. So we declare those, and then we use them. So when you look at the graph on the top, there's F1 coming into a broadcast, and from a broadcast, we have F2 and F4. And in the DSL, you can see it's pretty similar to what the graph looks like on the whiteboard. So that was an explicit design goal, and I think it's, I think it's nice. Um, I'm curious to hear your opinions about it. Feel free to share them. So I, I said this previously about flows, but let me reiterate that once you have a flow graph, it is immutable and safe to share between threads, and actually, we're gonna we are aiming to make it uh, possible to share between uh, nodes and clusters, because it is just a description of how we want to run things. So in theory, it could be freely shareable across clusters, but we're not there yet. That's a future plan. So uh, we have 20 minutes, so right on time. So I'm gonna jump into some examples. So let me open up IntelliJ here, not this one, not this one, yes, this one. So um, I have a few examples prepared and let's see how, uh, how much time we have left mm -hmm. after a few and then we'll decide if we're gonna go jump into Q&A right away or if we're gonna do an example more. So to reiterate, to reiterate how we use this thing, uh, you have an actor system, a flow materializer. I import a system dispatcher just to have something to execute futures on. Well, that's uh, not really an ACA specific thing, but it's a um, uh, Scala futures specific thing. So, how do we want to do this? Let's have a source. And let's see what kinds of sources we can have. So, sources can be from actors, that's for props. A source can be made from a graph, actually. It can be a timer source, which is the initial delay, interval, and tick thing. Then we can have a source from a future, an iterable, or a factory of iterators, or we can simply consume a reactive streams publisher. 
In our case, let's do something funny. Let's say hello. Let's say hello world. And, and to list it. So, so now it's going to be a list of characters. What can we do with this? So there's a number of different things. So for example, we can uh, drop a bunch of elements, filter, group by, you, you, you saw that one already, but we're going to do the usual traditional thing. So car, so the incoming thing is a car here, right? And then we can say C to upper, yeah, or as color syntax wise, we can do this. It means the same thing. Um, yeah, so what if I want to add some exclamation marks at the end of this? We have an operator for that, it's called concat. And concat means take this first source and drain it. And then once you're done draining that first source, start draining the second one. So in our case, we can start draining Same thing, not the most amazing uh, um, example here, but it's interesting because you can combine different sources of data and then the concat would basically serve, yeah, the first source of data is depleted, continue with the second source of the data, which is exactly what's happening here. And then we can maybe first start with the usual uh, more of a both way. So we have a sync object in Akka, and the sync has a bunch of helper methods. So here you can see all the kinds of sync we provide. Um, so for example, sync head means the first element that goes through the entire stream. In our case, it would be an H. So not very interesting. So let's use a for each. Actually, fold would be interesting. So fold means take some value, and while the stream is giving you new values, accumulate them into a new, new value. Actually, fold zero accumulator and car. Right. So that's the car, that's the accumulator, and we can say ac plus c. So what does this actually yield? So because this is a run with, it will materialize uh, the flow and run it. Here the implicit flow materializer is used from line 13, right? And the value will actually be a future Future of string. Future of string. I say Scala concurrent future. Right? Beca because we don't really know when the stream is going to finish, if it will finish ever, right? And then we can, on the value, perform a map, or maybe on complete, on complete. Um, text, print text, and we can just move the shutdown code I have under here into this guy. Now let me fire up compilation. Oh, I have a compile error in a different. Yep. And now let's try to run this guy. What? Yeah, so the configuration wasn't too happy in IntelliJ, in my console it's fine, so let's jump to the console. Whoop, whoop. Here we have the console. You can see I fired up running her word 
and it wrote success hello world. This is because on complete wraps it in a try, so it can be a, a success or a failure. Okay, but let's talk about graphs. Here I have a simple graph, which is basically the exact same thing that uh, we had before uh, on the slides. So time-wise, actually let's jump to the... I'll just simply show how you can easily write this one. So we allocate a var vcast, which is a broadcast of intermediate values, and then I need a merge. Actually, let's use a different element to make it a bit more interesting. So this is going to be a zip. So a zip is something that takes exactly two, uh, two streams and zips them together in a pair of things. And also notice that we have a Scala DSL and a Java DSL. This is because, of course, um, we try to make the best DSL possible for every language. So what looks nice in Scala doesn't necessarily look nice in Java and in the inverse way also. So when I zip from the Scala DSL, I will be getting a Scala tuple. We have something that is called a tuple. It has two elements. And when we zip in Java DSL, we get a Java um, pair. We have a helper class for that. So it's more usable for, for Akka users, which intend to yeah, just use Java. They are first-class citizen in a way. So I'm going to zip two enriched things. Right, let's prepare. And now, from the input, through F1, through the broadcast, and I'm going to use this no-format thing, uh, through the F2, through the zip left, so notice, um, whereas broadcast, you just feed into it, a zip actually has designated names for its inputs. So here we want to found the broadcast through F4, I believe, into not the left input, but now the right. And this is also type so the, the first type here is the left thing, the, the second type here is the right input. And then I'm going to uh, merge these. Merge. Oh, sorry. I wanted to show you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I meant to say zip out. So we have the output of this um, zip element. And I have to sync it into some, some sync. So here I had a publisher sync, which exposes a reactive streams publisher for consumption for anyone who wants to consume it. But uh, yeah, it was just a enriched, whereas now I have a pair of enriched elements. Okay, that's already one element more to, to know about. And also, um, while we are here, let's talk about map async. Because many of the, of the well, current APIs you, you're working with expose futures, right? So they expose a future of a result, not just the value. So here in the intermediate trait, we have a enrich or an enrich async. This is aims to yeah, act like a maybe HTTP call or something that has to go out to something and eventually gives you back the result. So here I'm using in a for a map async operator which works exactly like map, but is able to extract the value from the future and pass it along. So we pass on the element once the future succeed and successfully completes. If it fails, we pass along the failure of the stream. And yes, this is ordered, in case you're wondering. There is also an unordered case, because if you're doing multiple calls, everybody is waiting a little bit, uh, before they complete this future, maybe you don't care about order. You just want to proceed as fast as you can. So you want to generate demand, demand as fast as you can. The way to generate demand is to clear out processing, just keep processing stuff. So you want to process not in order, but unordered as fast as you can. So that's 
small little trivia that may be helpful in your processing pipelines. So the next one I want to show you is actually exactly, um, well, not exactly, a improvement over what we saw now. And this is gonna be, well, it's, it's okay, I have this left, right? This is kind of meaningful, especially for tuples. But when I have a person, I want to map into a zip into a person, how do I do that? So there's a bunch of ways to do it. But first, let's look at a, at a simple case. So I can prepare my zip to be, prepare my class here. It's going to be a simple one. And my zip can now be a zip width. And zip width is something that takes a function that will perform the zipping. Uh, no new, sorry. Yes, okay. And then we can take in a name, string, and an age, which will be mapping to this person. Right? Person H. So this is a very verbose way to put it. But now we can use the left and right to to zip into a person. So the output of zip let me realign these a bit. The output of zip is now a person. So this is better, but I was getting at how can how can we make this even nicer? So for first things, let's use some scholar goodness. So we can collapse this entire mapping thing into apply underscore, which will infer the proper type. So now zip, you can see it will take a string, take an int, and, and emit a person. So this is nice, but still not the best thing we can do. So now I'm going to show the last example for today. It will be a flexi merge which will allow us to write name and age. So we'll be able to have a nice processing graph that actually tells us what we are doing. So here we'll have to say new, uh, how do I call it? Let's say person, person merge. Start, extends a flexi merge. It's gonna emit a person. And then we have to create this merge logic. The merge logic will be responsible for reading this data because it will decide from which element, from which incoming stream we do what. And first we need to define a name and create input port. And a name is a string. And then we need age. And age is an int. So now you can see the lines 36, 37 compile, but it doesn't really yet do what we want it to. So we want to have a new merge logic. New merge logic of person. And we can skip this type notation. And I will implement it um, rather swiftly, so we're not completely out of time. So first we have to um, give it all the handles that we are going to be using in this merge. So in our case, it's going to be name and age. And then we'll use initial state. And this is going to be a state of read all inputs. You can read about these in, uh, in detail in the docs. But it essentially means I will emit an element Whenever all inputs I want to be reading, so read at all, read all, name and age. So this means whenever there's an element on both of these, read all and on name and on age, I want to trigger this function, which is context. This is not interesting in our case. Uh, this would normally contain which uh, input was triggered, but in our case, we trigger on all inputs, so we don't care. And then we can context emit a person from 
input name, input age. And you have to return a same state because this uh, state helper is actually a state machine. So whenever you get to emit an element, you can become another state. For example, I am now done and I will be completing this uh, stream. In our case, we stay in the same state. So this is how easily you can define your own mergers. And there's also a helper for uh, fan out elements. So that one is called a flexi root. Now let's jump back to slides and wrap up with questions. So to wrap up what we did, um, we talked a little bit about non-blocking non back pressure, how we do complex uh, graph processing pipelines, and a bunch of custom elements. Uh, what we didn't explore, but there's really a load of interesting stuff to see here, is how to put in explicit buffering, how to integrate with ARCA actors if you have existing systems or just need full control over uh, what actors give you, and time-based operations. So take while two seconds, that kind of operations. Um, what else do we have? F future plans. So the, the current state of ARCA streams is that we are stabilizing the API, and we are aiming to release a wanted o release um, yeah, maybe early next next month, not early, next month. Um, and of course, we are working on documentation, which is now getting a, a Java version. Then we are improving the, the testability. We want to provide a test kit, uh, similar to how you have test probes for ACA uh, normal, uh, ACA actors. And the most um, important thing to remember, ACA streams have not yet been performance tuned so you can expect a lot better performance because we have a bunch of um, known bottlenecks and known to be solved uh, bottlenecks. We just have to solve them, and we know how. So it's going to be way faster, and when you play around, around with it, you may actually think that it's already fast enough, as uh, some, some recent blog posts uh, show on the interwebs. That was quite interesting. So other than that, um, it would be great, and we are planning to do this at some point, to provide some visualization of these stream processing graphs. And there's an interesting uh, community project by Tim Harpner. You can have a look at it. I, I, I found it really awesome, so you can have a look. Uh, here's a bunch of links, and I wanted to um, yeah, direct you to our homepage, where you can get a bunch of free ebooks e if you're interested. Uh, with that, I think we have a little bit of time for questions. So I'm not sure how we're going to tackle questions. Yeah, great. Thank you, Conrad. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, uh, th th thank you for a wonderful webinar. Thank you. Um, so, so far, I see only uh, uh, just a few questions. So um, uh, I'll try to read it. Uh, the first mm -hmm. one from Thomas. Um, do I understand correctly um, that you don't have to manually specify the request of N back to the publisher? Yes, does, exactly. Yeah. Uh, does does the implementation or reactive stream API um, do that? So yeah. Okay. So um, the answer is depending on which API. So in reactive streams. If you don't request manually, you won't get any elements. So you do have to do this manually in reactive streams, which is the reason why ACA streams and other implementations are so useful, because we provide these request strategies and you don't have to care about this at all. You just provide buffer space, and in the case of ACA, you can provide a request strategy. For example, a good, uh, a good one is a, a high low watermark. So you know your buffer size and you give us a high and low watermarks when you want to start requesting and stop requesting. For example, if if you reach a high watermark of, of elements, so you have your buffer is 10, a high watermark is for example eight, you will stop requesting. So you can drain a little bit. And when you reach a low watermark, you will start re requesting again. But this is done transparently for you by ACA. 
Okay, thanks, Kunrud. And another question. Uh, I'm not sure I understand correctly, but still I read it. Um, I'm new to this program, and I want to know if the program has a capacity as Java. Um, uh, I, I believe uh, the question is about uh, performance. Ah, okay, yeah. So um, performance-wise, uh, the, the last numbers I've seen, um, oh, I'll probably say something wrong now. It's been a while. But Akka in general is able to perform with 5 million operations per second, message sends per second. And yeah, streams are Akka based. So we are aiming to get um, at least to a few million per second. So this usually is not the bottleneck of your application. And we tend to be the, the fast, on the faster side of things. So I wouldn't worry about performance. Okay, great. Uh, the next question, where can I find the source code that you showed? Okay, that's that's an easy one. Um, it's on GitHub. You go to Aka Aka, and the sources for the Aka streams are currently living on the branch release to three dash dev. I can write it in the uh, response. Uh, yeah. Okay. And I think it would be great if we could uh, share the slides also after the webinar. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Great. Um, and um, the next question, oh, I like it because uh, I I also had had this question. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the best use cases of using Arco streams, and ah. uh, when do you suggest now uh, not to use it? Okay. Um, hmm. Well, yeah, so I, I, sorry, I, I, I just believe uh, not everyone uh, uh, is aware uh, of um, Akka, and probably it would be great to cover, I'll you know, give uh, some examples on the use cases where uh, Streams Akka would be useful. Okay, yeah, gladly. So let's start maybe in, with Akka in general. So Akka in general is used when you need high scalability because we have, for example, the Akka cluster, which means that because of how actors work, they communicate only over messaging, uh, it is transparent to the user if this actor is on a remote, on, on this cluster, or, or on the local system. That, mean, that means that you can scale out by just adding clusters, uh, nodes to the cluster, and the application doesn't really have to change much, right? Because it just will dispatch still messages and because the code doesn't change if it's local or remote, you can just think about the concurrency in your system and not about, oof, but now I have to scale out and it's gonna be trouble. In Akka, uh, we give you this location transparency, so scaling out is easy. And also, even locally, we tend to be really high performance, like I said, five million messages per second. This usually is way higher than most applications need. And then Akka streams. So um, the downside of actors in general is that they are very, they can do anything, right? And if they can do anything, uh, it comes at a cost. It comes at a cost of uh, complexity of following the code paths. And with Akka streams, you have this precise path, how the elements are flowing uh, through this stream and what operations are being uh, done on them. So it's great for uh, these kinds of systems where you take some inputs, need to transform it in a bunch of ways and then signal it out to a bunch of other systems um, or just to a file. So a mini map reduce kind of things. You can totally do this in memory with Akka now. I hope this answers the question. Oh, and when, when not to yeah, use yeah, it? Yeah, I think so. Uh, hmm. uh, yeah, it was also a part of question. Let's see, when would you not use Akka? Well, like I said, it always comes performance costs. Um, performance costs on the complexity side a little bit. So if you have a problem that is easily solvable with one thread and the processing is going to take five minutes, on one hand maybe you don't need Akka. On the other hand, we do have very nice APIs. So you have to look at it and do the trade-off uh, comparison. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, next question. What if I need to change the state of a source using feedback from a sync? Example, Kafka source, depending on sync output, reset Kafka offset, 
to an earlier offset. Is it? I'm trying to find the question so I can read it because it was a bit complex. It's from uh, Evan. From Evan. Ah, hi Evan. Uh, let me read it again slowly. What if I need to change the state of a source using feedback from sync? Example, Kafka source depending on sync output. We set Kafka offset to an earlier. So that's like a, that sounds like a replay or something like that, that you need to reset the offset to something previous to, to replay these values. Sounds like that to me. So how I would, how I would model this is, um, I have not shown this today, but we can uh, do a graph, a complex graph, and your graph would have some feedback input. And this would be the feedback you can signal, hey, my source, can you please go back a bit or something? So a source uh, can be inside a graph. And then this graph can be as complex as you want. It can have multiple in, uh, feedback inputs, but then you can expose it to um, some other parts of uh, just as a source. So I, I think I would just model it as a graph and put the feedback as a explicit input. It doesn't have to be backpressed, for example. Hope this helps. Yeah, okay, so next question is quite uh, short message delivery guarantees. And I believe uh, it relates to the uh, next question also, how error handling is implemented in Arco streams. If one flow node fails, will other yeah. nodes eventually know about that? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, let's answer both at the same time. So um, message delivery guarantees, well, currently it is local. So it is in the same JVM, so there is no message loss. Um, that partially answers the question. So it's one JVM, so no network problems. On the other hand, I said we want to distribute this uh, to clusters eventually, right? So in there, we will actually have to re implement a re-delivery with acknowledgement. Uh, we have that internally for some system messages in ACA. So it's not an entirely new concept, but it's something we have to expose to streams for them to be able to re-deliver messages. And onwards to how error handling is implemented. So uh, the way of reactive streams to signal errors is either by canceling things or by, well, that's actually the key uh, method, by signaling on error. So when you have a subscriber, it has a bunch of methods, uh, like on the next, where you get the new element, on complete, when the stream completes, and finally, on error. And on error uh, gets a throwable, and this is how you pass around the uh, yeah, failure of the stream. So it would just tell, you, tell your subscriber that, yeah, on error because of something. And if it has a downstream, then it can propagate this error. So reactive streams-wise, like that. And we are still um, thinking about, because we are running on top of ACA actors, and in ACA actors we have a thing called uh, a supervision hierarchy. And the supervision hierarchy allows you to, yeah, if something failed, uh, resume, or if something failed, kill the entire thing. Um, so we have an ongoing discussion about that, how to integrate it with streams. Uh, I can just point you to the appropriate ticket on GitHub if you're interested. We are definitely thinking about doing something more fancy. Okay, thanks, Kunrut. Uh, next question. Uh, are there any plans for more predefined push-based sources, like the time source, for example, a source allowing custom external injection of mm -hmm. elements? Although yeah. Uh, although they might not be quite in line with reactive streams pr protocol. Mm -hmm. um, actually, they are, they are quite in line with the protocol. Um, just um, we call those hot sources. And so you cannot really back pressure time. That's, that's basically what it means. Or you cannot really back pressure a guy clicking the mouse, mouse like crazy. Um, 
Well, protocol-wise, it still fits because you are allowed to drop elements, right? Um, so, for example, there could be elements which, um, in in Rx, this one is called debounce. So uh, that means if I get a thousand clicks per second, yeah, don't don't send all of these downstream, but just send one in this one second. Um, so there's definitely support for that, but we don't have any built-in except for time source currently. I think the focus is a bit more on the backends currently, where such sources are can be avoided. And TCP doesn't really count. Uh, we have a TCP source, of course, uh, which we use for our HTTP and our IO. Um, but it's a bit different because the operating system also has a TCP buffer. And we are kind of reliant uh, additionally on the TCP buffer in the operating system. Um, so, does this actually, are there plans for, yeah, I think this answers the question. We are looking into what kind of sources we can provide. Um, we don't really have much push-based ones. Ah, okay, great. Uh, and probably the last question, how well mm -hmm. will Arco streams integrate with an existing Arco cluster application. As I understand, it currently creates a known actor system. Okay, so let's uh, first let's start with the misconception. The misconception here is that it creates an own actor system. It does not really have to create an own actor system. So if you have an existing application, you can use your existing actor, uh, actor system. Uh, what you will need to create is uh, the flow materializer. But this is only an object that takes care of the materialization. It is not additional thread pools. So you can reuse existing infrastructure in your app. And how well will it integrate with cluster? Well, cluster, how well will it integrate with actors on remote nodes, I would ask, because that's the key problem to solve. We are not there yet, so I won't really be um, yeah, pulling rabbits out of my head how it, lo how it will look like but we would really like to um, implement this. Okay. Okay, cool. Uh, I think that's that's all we got and we covered pretty much everything. Um, well, again, thank you, Conrad, for your great uh, presentation. And we'll be sharing uh, slides in our blog. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's it. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Thanks everyone, everyone for your time. Yeah. yeah. Take care. Yeah, bye. Have a good day. You too. Cheers.